أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We start by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as all praise is due to him. We praise him and we seek his assistance and his forgiveness. And we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. And we know that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can misguide them. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves to go astray, then none can guide them. And I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger. And I advise myself and my brothers and sisters as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised us in the Quran. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised us in his sunnah to have taqwa. And we know that taqwa is to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all that we say, in all that we do, at all times and all places. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from al-muttaqeen. And the Prophet ﷺ would always remind at the beginning of his speech that the best of words are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And the worst of affairs in this religion are those things that are innovated and added by people because they lead to misguidance which leads to the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it. <coughs> So Shaykh Hussein is uh, uh, off on a journey for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect him and bring him back safely. So we will talk about a topic today that you've heard about many times. But it's a topic that we can never uh, emphasize or stress or discuss enough. It's not, it's not a topic that we should ever tire from hearing about. And it is the secret to success. It is the key to success in this life and more importantly in the hereafter. And the Sahaba, they used to say we would never struggle with anything more than we would struggle with this topic. We would never strive and be concerned and work for any topic more than we would for this topic. Does anyone know what topic we're talking about? Anyone have a guess? What concept or what issue we're going to talk about? Iman. Okay, close. But we are talking specifically about ikhlas. Sincerity. Sincerity. To be sincere. To be devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do things solely and sincerely for his sake. It's something that is difficult and it's something that a person can never ever guarantee. A person who thinks that they are devout, that they are truly sincere, is doomed. But rather the most righteous of people are those who are always concerned that perhaps what they did was not 100% sincere. And because of that, they are continuously striving to improve and they are continuously putting forth great efforts to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The nature of this life, brothers and sisters, is that we cannot guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even accepted from us two rak'ahs. We cannot guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even accepted from us a simple prayer in full of two rak'ahs. So we will discuss about this topic in a bit of detail and this is one of the important topics in the concept of purification of the soul. Purification of one's heart and one's soul starts with this concept. So let's discuss it. Sincerity is the freeing of one's intentions from all impurities in order to come nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I want you to take a simple example and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are only the highest of examples. But think about your own self. If somebody were to give you something, for example they said here is a glass of milk. Nice pure cold glass of milk for you to drink. 
Then they said, but if you don't mind, I will just put one drop of filth. One drop. It's a big glass, but I will put one small drop of impurity, urine, filth in that drink, if you don't mind. Would you accept it? He would say, disgusting. I will never accept such a thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only deserves perfection. Only deserves that which is purely done for his sake. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever associates partners with me, then I abandon him and his action. I reject both. I will not accept such an action that has a mixed intention. For example, we do a good deed such as praying, but we show off. We do it so that people could say about us that we are righteous. Or we give charity so people would say that we are generous, for example. So this concept is what made the Sahaba strive. Maybe what I did was 99.9% .9 in sincere intention. But what if there was that 0.01% that was not sincere? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reject that action from me. So they would continuously strive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us our oxygen to breathe. What if he says, I will just take it away for one hour a day. You don't have oxygen to breathe anymore. But 23 hours, you have it. Good. You will die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us and gives us completely and takes care of us and pr protects us and provides for us. So he only deserves that what we give back be sincere and purely done for his sake. It is to ensure that the intentions behind all acts of worship and obedience to Allah are exclusively for his pleasure. It is the perpetual contemplation of the creator to the extent that one forgets the creation. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the ones who truly have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are humbled before Him, they are so sincere to Him, are the ones who are knowledgeable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are the ones that are knowledgeable. Of course, knowledge is two types. Knowledge is two types. There is knowledge that's only on your tongue. May Allah protect us. But there's knowledge that settles in the heart. And that's something different. Knowledge that is on the tongue, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, there will be people that recite the Qur'an, it never passes their throat. Meaning they recite verses of Qur'an, but it doesn't penetrate their heart. They don't internalize the meanings of those verses, and therefore act and implement what those verses say. So to have knowledge of something is not to have faith and belief in it necessarily. So shaitan, for example, Satan, he knows without a doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. He spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He even called on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the utmost respect because he knows how powerful and mighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. But that doesn't make him a true believer. So mere knowledge on the tongue is worthless and will be a case against us on the day of judgment rather than for us. But true knowledge is what settles in the heart and bears fruits in our actions and our words. So that's why they said there is a direct correlation between faith and knowledge, between faith and action, excuse me, between iman and amal. If a person has true belief, then it will show in their actions. And that's why our brothers and sisters who when they are called to do good things like pray, or wear hijab, for example. And they say, oh, brother, sister, you don't know. Faith is in my heart. Well, if faith is truly in your heart, then it will bear fruits. It will show in your actions and in your words and in your beliefs. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that true knowledge. So when we have this true knowledge, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of his names and attributes, of his greatness, and how can we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatness and his names and attributes? What are the two sources that we can know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life? Anyone can tell me? Two main sources we can know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are they? Say it again. Quran, okay. And say it again. Hadith, okay. 
These two actually I'm putting them together. This is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran and Sunnah are revelation from Allah. This is one of the main ways we can know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is available for everyone, but only the believers truly benefit from it. What's the second source that's also available for all of mankind to know about Allah? The creation. The creation. The second book of Allah is His creation. When you look around, you can see the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see His power, His greatness, His wisdom, His mercy, His knowledge, and so on and so forth. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to ponder and reflect on His creation and to travel throughout the earth and to look and to see the greatness of Allah's creation. So we can know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these two sources. When you reach a certain level in the way that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what you believe about Him, as the authors are mentioning here, you reach a point where you forget about the creation when it comes to your intention in doing good deeds. Because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns all things. And that's why, let me share a verse with you. Just give me one second. I want to give you the proper translation for that verse. Okay, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he's one of the great scholars. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah was somebody who would contemplate deeply upon the verses of the Qur'an. So look what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, there is not a single thing except that its depositories and treasures are with us. Surah Al-Hijr, uh, Surah number 15, verse 21. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is not a single thing except that its depositories and treasures are with us. Meaning Allah owns and is in control of all things. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, this verse comprises a great treasure from the treasures of the Qur'an. This being that nothing is sought except from the one who possesses its depositories and treasures. The one in whose hands lie the keys to these treasures. Seeking things from anyone else is seeking something from one who does not possess them or possess any authority over them. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah it says that this verse summarizes ikhlas for us. You should only be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of your acts of devotion. Why? Because of this verse. Can anyone explain to me this correlation? Do we see what the connection is between this verse and being sincere to Allah? When we do something for other than Allah, do we hope for something in return? We do. We hope for something. Whether it's for people to praise us or to think good about us, to like us, for money, for power, for fame, for authority, to get a certain person in our life, maybe a, a husband or a wife, and so on and so forth. So when we have an intention other than doing something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want something in return. We hope to get something in this life, or perhaps we even hope for something in the hereafter, as those who believe in other religions and worship other gods, they still hope for something in the hereafter. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already informs us in the Qur'an that He is the one that holds the keys to everything. Everything that you want, everything that you seek in this life or the hereafter, Allah is in full control and authority over it. So if there was a king who controls all things, and then there's a guy who sweeps the street, and you go to the guy who sweeps the street and you say, listen, I need money. I need power. I need protection. I need this. I need that. What would people say about you? They would say you are stupid. You go to the one, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have authority. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have power. He cannot give you the things that you seek. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of all kings. He controls all things. 
So when you turn to other than him, what would you benefit from that? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, shall we tell you about the biggest losers? The ones who thought they were doing something. They thought they were building something good, but on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We would come to their actions, what they have done, their deeds, and they would be turned to dust, to nothing. Poof, gone. They had done a lot of actions, maybe some were good, but they didn't do them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who would be able to reward on the day of judgment other than Allah? Nobody. Nobody can even speak on the day of judgment without Allah's full permission and without Allah being pleased with what they have to say. Can you imagine? People will not even be able to move their eyes without Allah's permission. They will not be able to do anything, much less reward other people, much less punish other people, forgive other people. They will not be able to. Nobody. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell people who did things for the wrong intention, go to the one for whom you did it. You did it for those people, for that false god, for whatever reason, go to that. See if it can reward you. See if it can help you. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be able to reward. And before the hereafter, in this life, we should already be certain that nothing can happen except by the will of Allah. Not even your boss in your job is in control of your money. If he, if he wants to fire you but Allah doesn't want you to lose the job, you will not lose it. He doesn't want to hire you but Allah wants you to get the job, you will get it. Whether he likes it or not. So we have to know and be certain and remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in full control. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he makes this beautiful connection between this verse and sincerity. The verse is, there is nothing, not a single thing, except that its depositories and treasuries and treasures are with us. Meaning Allah is in full control of all things. Power, authority, money, fame, control, reward in this life or the hereafter, to feel good, to be happy, whatever it is that you might seek and want. Some people say, I don't do things for any reason. Because when you do it for a reason, that's selfish. I do things for no reason. We say you're a liar. You're a liar. You do things so that your ego can feel good. So that you can feel proud of yourself and good about yourself. Don't lie. You are doing it. Actually, you became a worshiper of your own self. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you seen those who have taken as a God their own whims and desires? They became, became a worshiper of their own whims and desires. Whatever they feel, whatever they want, that's what they worship. Rather than worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created them and gave them all things. And then Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah brings another verse in relation to this topic. And he says, and that to your Lord is the final goal. Surah Al-Najm, Surah 53 verse 42. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and that to your Lord is the final goal. So what is the connection again between this verse and sincerity? You see these great scholars, they would ponder deeply about the verses of the Qur'an. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, it co comprises an immense treasure. This being that every desired object that is not desired for his sake, for Allah's sake, and is not connected in any form to him, then it is temporary. It's temporary. And soon to disappear for its final goal is not with him. So if your final goal is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward, then whatever you want and whatever you get because of it, it's temporary. مَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَمْفَدْ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقْ What you have will perish, will vanish, temporary. But what is with Allah will remain forever. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is again connecting this to the concept of sincerity. You want to do something for any reason, don't do it for something that will last only for a day, or a week, or a year, or ten years. Do something that will last forever. And that's why the Prophet wasallam, when they mentioned to him, or when he mentioned to his family what was left from the sheep. I mentioned this one many times before. And they said we left only the shoulder. This was the part that the Prophet ﷺ used to like to eat. 
So they gave all the rest of it in charity. So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, all of it is left. All of it will remain except this part. Because all of it that was given in charity will remain forever. In the hereafter, they will have the reward of it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the part that they will eat now and enjoy will be gone, finished, vanish. It will not last forever. The final goal lies only with one to whom all matters find their conclusion, terminating at his creation, his will, his wisdom and knowledge. Therefore, he is the source of every desired matter. Everything that is loved, if it is not loved for the sake of Allah, then this love is nothing but distress and punishment. Every action that is not performed for his sake, then it is wasted and severed. Every heart that does not reach him is wretched, veiled from achieving its success and happiness. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gathered everything that could be desired from him in his saying of these two verses. There is not a single thing except that its depositories and treasures are with us and he has gathered everything that is done for his sake in his saying and that to your Lord is the final goal. Therefore, there is nothing beyond Allah that deserves to be sought. And nothing finds its conclusion with other than him. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah has beautifully summarized the topic of ikhlas in these two verses. That if you're going to do something, don't do it for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because whatever you would get out of it would be temporary, number one. And number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one actually that is in control of all things. So how many a person, for example, strives to please people? at the expense of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and people are never pleased with them. People are never pleased with them. They're hated. They cannot earn love although they try to buy it, although they try to force it, whatever position of authority they may be in, even the dictator ruling millions of people tries to get the people to love them, to obey them, to this, to that. They are unable to succeed. Subhanallah. So in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that controls all things, even people's hearts. Now sincerity is a condition for Allah's acceptance of good deeds. What's the second condition? If there are two conditions, this is the first, sincerity. What's the second condition? Ittiba. Doing it in accordance with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sunnah. Why is that a condition? Why is that a condition? We go back to the basic concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is in full authority. So he is the one who decides what is good and what is bad. Sometimes we find our brother or sister doing something wrong and we tell them this is wrong. And they say, but I have a good intention. But I'm doing it for Allah's sake. Well, it doesn't matter. Your good intention, your sincerity cannot change a, a bad deed into a good deed. Cannot change a bad deed into a good deed. If something is wrong, if something is bad, it remains bad. It remains bad. You cannot make it into something that is good. Of course, except in specific cases where it's some kind of life or death emergency. So maybe you eat something haram to survive. This is a very specific case. But in general, your sincerity doesn't make something bad good. So as uh, uh, they, they try to say sometimes the ends justify the means. No, we don't believe that in Islam. The ends don't justify the means. Even if your goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if what you are doing is wrong, it stays wrong. And at the same token, if what you are doing is perfect, good deed, so Excellent in the way you are doing it, the way the Prophet ﷺ did it, but your intention is not correct. Then you will not get any good deeds for it. You will be sinful. You will be sinful. So that's why we can see two people might be praying next to each other exactly the same way, following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to the T perfectly. But the difference between their prayers is like the difference between the sky and the earth. Huge difference in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala views it because of what's going on inside. Because of the sincerity, because of the intention and so on. And that's why a person should be so careful about being proud of themselves. 
You should never have self-admiration. Look at me, I'm so righteous. Look at me how I am praying. Look at me how I give charity, how I do this and how I do that. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the believers give what they give and they're scared. Scared of what? They are not criminals. Scared that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't accept. Scared that what they did was not sincere. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may reject it and hold them accountable for it because they did it for someone else's sake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded in the Quran, He says, and they have been commanded to worship only Allah, being sincere towards Him in their deen, in their way of life, and true. Abu Umama has related that a man once came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, what of a man who joined us in the fighting? Jihad. Putting his life in danger to defend his religion, his family, his property. So the Prophet ﷺ is being asked about this great action. But his intention is fame or booty. Fame or wealth, spoils of war. The Prophet ﷺ said he receives nothing. He doesn't get anything for that. No good deeds. The man repeated the question three times. And each time the Prophet ﷺ said he receives nothing. Then he said, Allah only accepts actions that are intended purely for his pleasure. So even if it's the most noble of actions, a person will not benefit from it if they didn't do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why there's a very terrifying hadith. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu used to narrate this hadith. And they said when he will try to narrate it, he will fall unconscious. He could not finish the entire hadith. He will say part of it, then he will pass out. Then the students will splash water on his face to wake him up. Then he will try to continue and he will pass out again. Because of how terrifying the hadith is. The Prophet ﷺ said the first people that will be thrown into the hellfire to fuel it up. To flare the hellfire and make it hot. Will be the person who fought in jihad. The person who gave charity. And the person who taught Quran. Three people, three types of people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that person on the day of judgment and it will be said to them, Oh my servant, I gave you such and such. What did you do with it? He says, Oh my Lord, I did for your sake. So one will say, You gave me strength and I went in jihad for your sake. And the other one will say, You gave me money and I gave charity for your sake. And the other one will say, You gave me knowledge and I taught for your sake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Kathabd, you lie. You're a liar. You did it so that the people would say, and they have already said. May Allah protect us. You did it so that the people would say about you, that you are brave, that you are generous, that you are righteous, knowledgeable, whatever it is. And the people have already said that. You got what you wanted. You did it to show off. You did it for fame only. You didn't do it for my sake. So the person will be thrown in the hellfire, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri related that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in his khutbah during the farewell pilgrimage, Allah will bless whoever hears these words and whoever understands them. For it may be that those who pass on this knowledge are not those who will understand it the best. There are three things concerning which the heart of a believer should feel no enmity or malice. Number one, devoting one's actions to Allah. You shouldn't have envy of somebody who is doing that. Giving counsel to the imams of the Muslims, to the leaders of the Muslims, and being loyal to the majority, to the jama'ah. What is meant here is that these three things strengthen the heart. And whoever distinguishes himself in them will have a heart purified from all manner of deceit, corruption, and evil. Because you find that these things require a certain level of sincerity, all three of them. To give counsel to the leader, people usually don't know that. You come privately to a leader and you advise them, fear Allah and this and that. By doing so, you put yourself in danger. Because this is a leader, he can imprison you, kill you, do many things against you. And you don't benefit from doing that. No one knows about it. You don't become famous. The leader will not come out and say, because so and so advised me, now I will change my policy. No. So you are doing it sincerely for Allah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said the best of shuhada, of martyrs, the highest level of martyrs, is Hamza, 
radiallahu anhu, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the one who was killed for speaking the truth to an unjust ruler. He says the word of truth, advising a ruler, and that ruler will have him killed. Even that ruler may be a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, didn't say kafir, he said unjust. So such a thing might happen and that person, because they are being so sincere in giving this advice, they are not benefiting from that in any way, then it is something that would make them from the highest level of shuhada. And the last one is being loyal to the majority. It's easy to betray. It's easy to give information to the enemy, to help the other side, to betray the jama'ah without them knowing and for you to actually get benefit in this life. So when you have that loyalty and that sincerity to the Muslims, then this is something that also purifies the heart and proves sincerity. A servant can only free himself from shaitan through sincere devotion. How many are a brother or a sister says, I am bothered by shaitan. I cannot pray with proper concentration. I cannot recite Qur'an and feel the proper effects of it. Shaitan is always encouraging me and inciting me to do evil. And he has a lot of influence over me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gave the formula. He said that Iblis, Shaitan himself, said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as is mentioned in the Qur'an, except those of your servants who are sincere. Shaitan said, the ones I will not be able to misguide and have influence over are those who are sincere to you. Those who are sincere to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are sincere. It was related by a righteous man. He said, O oh self. He's talking to himself. You see, the pious predecessors, they used to treat their soul like a separate entity. They will sit sometimes. You don't do it in front of people. Maybe they will think you're crazy. But they will sit and they will scold themselves. And they will talk to themselves and they will advise themselves out loud. They will say, what's wrong with you? You know that's wrong. Why do you want to do it? Don't do it. Because the nafs, they would treat it like it's a riding beast. Like a horse or an animal. You need this animal to get to your journey's end, to your destination. In this life, we are trying to go to paradise. And this animal is going to get us there. If you beat the animal and you treat it so badly, obviously it may give up. But if you also let it go without any control, without any reins, also it will take you astray. It will never get you to your destination. If you give it whatever it wants, if you let it have whatever it wants, food and sex and drugs and this and that, and you don't try to control it and guide it down the right way, obviously it will go astray. So they would look at it as this kind of separate entity and they would have this sort of love-hate relationship with themselves. Sometimes reminding, scolding, praising. One of them would say, I would seek assistance against myself in worshipping Allah by rewarding myself with candy. He says, I will worship Allah, but if you worship Allah continuously for a long time, praying at night, reading Quran, fasting, you will get tired. It can be difficult, depending on your level of stamina and tolerance spiritually. So he said, then I will give a break and I will reward myself with candy because I love candy. My nafs loves candy. So I give it and I say, okay, this is it. You ready now? Let's continue on. Let's go for more. And they will push themselves. See how they would, they would look? Just like a bodybuilder or anyone in this life will deal with their body. Okay, now I need a rest. But now we go back. Let's go. I will try to eat some good food, get some sleep, and then go again for more weightlifting or whatever it is. So they would look at the same way when they are dealing with their spirit and with their soul. It has been related that a righteous man used to say, O self, be devout, be sincere, and you will be pure. When any worldly fortune in which the self finds comfort and towards which the heart inclines intrudes upon your worship, then it impairs the purity of our efforts and ruins our sincerity. This is why the righteous people and the Sahaba were always so cautious about the worldly life. Of course, they know there is a minimum they need from the worldly life. But they would try not to let the love of the worldly life intrude upon their heart. Love for money, power, fame, control, the opposite gender, whatever it might be. From the things that people love, they would try not to let that permeate their heart so that it would ruin their sincerity and their intention. And they would begin to do things only for the sake of those things. 
man is pre pre preoccupied with his good fortune and immersed in his desires and appetites. Rarely are his actions or acts of worship free from temporary objectives and desires of this kind. You see, the problem with the nafs is that it's insatiable. The nafs is yourself, yourself, your soul. It's insatiable. No matter how much you try to give it, it will never be satisfied actually from the worldly life. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, if the son of Adam has a valley full of gold, a valley, imagine a valley of gold, this is billions. You cannot spend it actually in your lifetime. The son of Adam, the Prophet ﷺ said, would want a second one full. So there's no time where you will reach a point where you say, Psh, I have more than enough, I don't want anything else, I don't need anything else, unless you are attached to the hereafter and you truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This life, they gave the example, is like a thirsty person who is trying to quench their thirst from the ocean. Drink the whole ocean, it will only make you more thirsty. Because the ocean is salt water. No matter how much you drink, you become more thirsty. So this life is like that. The more you get, the more you want. The more you get, the more you realize is out there. Wow, I can get this kind of house. What about that kind of house? What about that kind of car? What about that kind of job? What about that kind of title before my name? And so on and so forth. So the more you get, the more you end up wanting. Unless a person finds themselves satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree and pleased. So you see those great believers, they would not be shaken. If Allah took everything of this worldly life away from them, they were satisfied. And if Allah gave them everything, they were also satisfied. They would not become overly sad or overly happy about worldly things. So Aisha radiallahu anha would receive, for example, in one day she got 180,000 dirham, 180,000 silver coins. It's a huge amount of money in that time. So she distributed it all in half of a day. She distributed it all from the morning until Maghrib. So she had been fasting that day. I've told this story before if you remember. So she said to her worker, let's uh, break our fast. If there's any food, please bring it. Let's eat. She said, there's nothing. There's no food. We don't have food. And there's no money left. You distributed it all. If you at least would have left one coin, we could have bought some meat, something. We could have broken our fast, but there's nothing. Just some old bread and a little bit of oil. That was it. So she said, if you would have reminded me, I would have done it. But she didn't even think about it. She didn't care. She's not attached to that money, but she's thinking about those who need it more and she's thinking about the hereafter. Even though she herself is in need. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about these great believers, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They give and prefer others over themselves even though they themselves are in need actually. Subhanallah. So for this reason it has been said that whoever secures a single moment of pure devotion to Allah in his life will survive. For devotion is rare and precious and cleansing the heart of its impurities is an exacting undertaking. So the Sahaba they used to say, if I know Allah has accepted from me two rak'ahs completely, I will not do anything else. I will feel guaranteed, set. But because I don't know that Allah has even accepted two rak'ahs, then I keep striving and I keep working and I do more and more and I never give up. Because if you know Allah accepted from you, means you were sincere, means you are from al-muttaqeen, means guaranteed you're going to Jannah. But because a person doesn't know that, then they continuously strive. And that's why when we do good things, we should not feel proud. But rather we should be humbled. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guided us to do that good and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that can accept it and purify the intentions. In fact, devotion is the purifying of the heart from all impurities, whether few or many, so that the intention of drawing nearer to Allah is freed from all other motives except that of seeking His pleasure. This can only come from a lover of Allah. Somebody who truly loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is so absorbed in His contemplation in, uh, in the contemplation of the next world that there remains in his heart no place for the love of this world and that's how the Sahaba became to the point that one of them would say there is nothing in this world that I care for anymore 
Nothing. Money, power, all those things. I don't care about them. The only thing I still like from this world is fasting on a long, hot summer day. What? Fasting on a long, hot summer day? Means you will get thirsty and hungry and tired. They said, that's the only thing I can look forward to. That's the only thing I like from this life still. To go through some difficulty and sacrifice for the sake of Allah. And to mix with my brothers and sisters who I love only for the sake of Allah and we have no worldly benefit between us. One of them would say, this is the only thing I still enjoy and look forward to in this world. Otherwise, I'm only waiting to meet Allah in the next. Subhanallah. So they became so detached that Allah had to tell them, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget about your portion in this worldly life. Because they had completely abandoned the worldly life and were running fully for the hereafter. So one of them was eating nice food right before the battle. Then he said, O Messenger of Allah, if I go in the battlefield and I die, what will happen? He said, you will go to paradise. He said, Bakh and Bakh. How amazing. And he threw the food and he went running for the battlefield. Immediately. Immediately. Because they believed in that more than they believed in the dunya that's already in their hands. And they longed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter more than we long for this life. Such a person must be devout and pure in all his actions, even eating, drinking, and answering the call of nature. With rare exceptions, anyone who is not like this will find the door of devotion closed in their face. The everyday actions of a person who is overwhelmed by his or her love for Allah and the Akhirah are characterized by this love. And they are in fact pure devotion. In the same way, anyone whose soul is overwhelmed by love for and pure preoccupation with this world or status or authority will be so overwhelmed by these things that no act of worship, be it prayer or fasting, will be acceptable except in very rare cases. So two extremes. If you love Allah so much, it becomes even your mundane actions become acts of worship and you're rewarded for them. But if you're so overwhelmed by preoccupation and love for this world, then even your praying and fasting will not be accepted. Because you end up mixing the intentions and your goal is always somehow this worldly life. If even you're able to pray and fast because the love of this worldly life can end up taking people away. You tell them, brother, you cannot find five minutes to pray. He said, brother, I'm busy. I work. I have to make money. Mashallah. 24 hours, you cannot find 25 minutes. Five prayers times five minutes. Cannot find 25 minutes in the day to give for Allah when He gave you breath and He gave you life and He gave you food and drink and so on. Every single minute of every single day. And then we say, 25 minutes, too much. One hour, you want me to devote for Allah? How can I do it? Ramadan, you need me to fast? I have to work. I have to make money. I cannot. I will be tired. You want me to go for hajj? You know how much hajj costs? How much money? Oh, it's very tiring. It's hard work. It's only five days. You cannot give five days out of your lifetime for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So when a person becomes so overwhelmed by the worldly life, they find it difficult to give anything for the sake of Allah. While those who truly love Allah, they find it difficult to not do anything except for the sake of Allah. Even using the toilet. Can you imagine? Means their intention behind everything constantly, they're finding how can this bring me closer to Allah. Even my eating, my drinking, my sleeping, and so on. The remedy for love of this world is to break the worldly desires of the self, ending its greed for this world and purifying it in preparation for the next world. This will then become the state of the heart and sincere devotion will become easier to attain. There are a great many actions where a man acts, thinking they are purely intended for Allah's pleasure, but he is deluded, for he fails to see the defects in them. And this is where we need to be cautious and humble and constantly ask ourselves and test ourselves, Because the shaitan and the nafs are working to ruin your good intention before the action, during the action, and after the action. Before the action, before you even start, he says, oh, you know, the people are going to see you when you give charity. You will be so generous. You will be famous amongst the community. Then during the action, he will come to you. You were doing it solely for the sake of Allah, but there's nothing wrong with the people also thinking good things of you and you have a good reputation. 
And then he comes to you after the action, that action you did sincerely for the sake of Allah, you should tell everyone about it. Let them be motivated. Show them the good things that you have done. And you begin to brag and talk about it after it's already been done. So shaitan will never rest and will strive to ruin your good deeds before, during, or after. This is a, a, a good example of how we may think we are doing good, but we may find out that we were not sincere. It has been related that a man was used to praying in the first row in the mosque. He will always come early to be in the first row. First row, special rewards for praying in the first row. Is that correct? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew the reward for making the call for prayer and praying in the first row, you would compete to get it. If the only way you could find was to draw names, to draw lots. So you would, you would rush for that. I've been in some places, some countries and some masajid, especially if it's a mosque where there are knowledgeable scholars and great students of knowledge. Even if you come half hour before the prayer, you cannot find a place in the first row. It's already full. People sitting there camping, waiting because they want that reward. But unfortunately, in some cultures, I found in some mosques, you come in, it, even the, the iqama has already been made and the people are still standing in the back. What is that? And they come 10-15 minutes before the prayer, they sit against the back wall. Why would you give up that place? doesn't make sense. And they look at it like they are being humble or something. I'm not sure what the, co the concept is exactly. So those who go sit in the front, this is like audacious. How come you're going sitting in the front? You think you are better than the others or something? No. That is what you are supposed to rush and do because you believe you are the most in need of good deeds. You need it more than others because they are better than you. You are not as good as them. That's why you rush to the front to get the reward. This is the concept actually that we should have. So this man, he used to always pray in the first row of the mosque. So one day he was late for the prayer. So he ended up praying in the second row. He's praying now in the second row. So feeling embarrassed when people saw him in the second row, he realized that the pleasure and satisfaction of the heart that he used to gain from praying in the first row was due to his seeing people seeing him there and admiring him for it. You understand? So he said, when I felt embarrassed for praying in the second row, means that actually all along when I was praying in the first row and feeling good about that, it was not because I was doing a good deed for the sake of Allah. It was because I was proud and happy that people were seeing me and saying, wow, righteous man, always he's praying in the first row. He comes early to the prayer, mashallah. He cares about good deeds, blah, blah, blah. Right? So we have to always be so cautious. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in this life. Alif lam mim ahasib an nasu an yutraku. أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين. Allah subhanahu wa taala swears by alif lam mim and he says, do the people think they will be left to say they believe and they won't be tested? And we did indeed test the people that came before them and we will make it known who are truthful and we will make it known who are the liars. So Allah subhanahu wa taala already knows who is sincere. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose the fact to us, to our own selves and to others who is sincere and who is not. So we may find ourselves going down an endeavor and then we come to a small speed bump, small pothole. And then we say, oh, dangerous road, I'm going back, never mind. I cannot finish the journey. So then maybe you were not sincere, that means. So we need to ask ourselves, always questioning ourselves, why am I doing this? If nobody could see me right now, would I still be doing it? If nobody knew about this action, would I still do it as good and as well as I'm doing it now? And that's why the righteous person always needs to have actions which nobody knows about. So the Prophet ﷺ used to say things like, Sallu wa nasu niyam. Pray while everyone else is sleeping. Get up and pray and everyone is sleeping. Nobody knows you are praying. Because now it's a prayer only for Allah. Five daily prayers, we pray in jama'ah and there are many benefits for that. Many great societal benefits for that. But the individual should have also their own prayer. That's why it's sunnah to pray your sunnah at home. Not in the masjid. It's sunnah to pray your sunnah at home. Because at home, maybe you don't care so much about what your family will think. Or you can even do it in your home without your family knowing. 
So the Prophet ﷺ was encouraging us to have these kind of actions. Some actions are public, but some are also private. And that's why they said the true believers, the truly devout person, is as cautious about concealing their good deeds as they are about concealing their bad deeds. We all don't want our bad deeds to be exposed. Is that right? We don't want people to know about our mistakes and our negative qualities. We have many bad things. Only Allah knows and we wish and hope nobody will ever know about them. Even on the Day of Judgment, may Allah conceal and protect us. But the idea is, are we as cautious about concealing good deeds as we are about concealing bad deeds? We should. We should. And that's why the scholars, they mention a beautiful thing. They say, we know so many great things about Sahaba. How much they gave and how much they sacrificed and did. They said, you better believe they had a lot more that we don't know about. That's only a fraction of what they used to do. What we can see. But many other things they may have done and may have had that was secret and that they would conceal from public's eyes. Subhanallah. So imagine how much good they used to do beyond what we even used to know. Now this is a subtle and intangible condition and actions are rarely safe from it. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he called riya showing off. He called it the hidden, hidden shirk. Hidden shirk. It's more hidden than a small black ant crawling on a black rock in the dark of night. You cannot see it. You cannot even feel it or sense it in your own self. You feel good about an action. You say this is the good that Allah gives a believer when they do good actions. But this brother who when he prayed in the second row, he felt, hey, I feel embarrassed from the people. That means the whole time I was doing it for the people's sake. It was not sincere for Allah's sake. So may Allah protect us because we may not even realize until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would test us or expose that action to us. So we need to always be questioning ourselves and concerned about our sincerity. Apart from those whom Allah has assisted, few are aware of such delicate matters. Those who do not realize it only come to see their good deeds appearing as bad ones on the day of resurrection. They are the ones referred to in Allah's words and something will come to them from Allah which they had never anticipated for the evil of their deeds will become apparent to them. May Allah protect us. So they think they are doing good but Allah will expose it on the day of judgment that you were not doing it for a good reason. So your deeds were not accepted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, shall we tell you who will lose most in respect of their, their, their deeds and actions? Those whose efforts were astray in the life of this world while they thought that they were doing good works. While they thought that they were doing good actions. Yaqub said, a devout person is someone who conceals things that are good in the same way that he conceals things that are bad. Asusi said, true devotion is to lose the faculty of being conscious of your devotion. So listen closely to this. For someone who identifies devotion in his devotion is a person whose devotion is in need of devotion. <laughs> Did you understand it? So if you think you are sincere, means you are not that sincere. No. If you really think you are sincere, 100%, and your action was guaranteed, accepted by Allah, then you're not a sincere person. Means your devotion still needs devotion. You should be concerned. You should never feel guaranteed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted your good deeds or you feel proud of yourself because of what you have done. To contemplate devotion is to admire it and admiration is an affliction and that which is pure is whatever is free of all afflictions. This means that one's deeds should be purified from any self-admiration concerning the actions they entail. Okay, what does that mean? Should you feel proud of yourself when you do good deeds? Should you? No. No. That's why the scholars, they said, when you say Alhamdulillah, you have to say Alhamdulillah for saying Alhamdulillah. You have to thank Allah when you thank Allah. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guided you to do so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave you the ability to do so. Are the majority of mankind on earth thanking Allah? No. Are the majority of mankind on earth believing in Allah? So how come you believe in Allah? How come you thank Allah? That's only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the true believer, the more good they do, the more they become humble, not proud, not full of self-admiration. 
the more they become humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking and begging for his acceptance for his forgiveness for their shortcomings for him to bless them to continue to do good deeds so they realize that all the good is only attributable to Allah not to themselves and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said none of you will enter paradise by your actions so the Sahaba said even you a messenger of Allah he said even me until and unless Allah covers me with his mercy and grace so it's only by Allah's mercy and grace that we go to paradise because of course we cannot earn paradise not by quantity nor by quality of what we have done and even the good that we have done it's only by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the person when they do good they only feel more humbled because Allah is helping them to do that good and you test yourself you're going down a good path if you start to feel proud of yourself and good about yourself see if you continue down strongly on that path you will not you will not you will fall short one day you were praying Fajr in the masjid for months all of a sudden oversleeping every day what happened before when you were praying so proud alhamdulillah I don't miss Fajr in the masjid how come there are people they oversleep Psh, those people they're not good then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you fall on your face so you can wake up you are arrogant you are proud of what you didn't do anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped you and guided you and if he wants he'll snatch it away from you again and that's why the righteous they become more and more humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they beg and beg him more and depend on him more and more completely completely in everything for this life and the hereafter that's why they said the Sahaba they will make dua to Allah when they want salt 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 costs you pennies nothing but they want some salt for their food they will make dua to Allah they rely on Allah for everything because they know nothing can come except from him so they had such an attachment and a connection to him Ayyub said it is much harder for the people of action to purify their intentions than it is to execute any of their actions the action itself that's the easy part sometimes we feel so difficult and we struggle with that the real difficult part that we need to be concerned about is the intention so sometimes we can see that external things and even ourselves we do many external actions and we feel so proud of them but we forgot about the internal actions of the heart because if they are not in line then those external actions mean nothing you did the physical motions of prayer but maybe your prayer was a sin against you because you had no khushua no sincerity so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even accept it he will actually punish you for it so this is where the person should be really concerned about the most difficult element of action and that is the intention and what is inside some people have said to be devote for a short while is to survive forever but devotion is rare so if you are actually sincere even a bit then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you but it's difficult to confirm that you've even been sincere a little bit Suhail was asked what is the most difficult thing for the self he said devotion when the self does not have the good fortune of being endowed with it meaning Allah didn't bless you with it Al Fudail said now this is another concept can be a bit confusing for people listen closely Al Fudail said forsaking action for the sake of other people is to seek their admiration to act for the sake of their admiration is to associate others with Allah devotion is when Allah frees you from both of these states so the idea now is some brothers and sisters when they become religious they will come and ask this question brother I don't want to make adhan why because I'm afraid I will not be sincere I'll be showing off so because of this intention I will not make adhan oh well this is showing off this is shirk because doing good actions to show off for people that's shirk and not doing actions because of people is also shirk so it's when you are freed from both so it means you have to continue on and do the good deed but you have to strive against yourself which longs for admiration which longs for praise which longs to show off you have to fight against that but you cannot stop doing good deeds because you said oh the people think that I am righteous and knowledgeable so I better change I will shave my beard and I won't go to the mosque too much because now the people are saying you are sheikh and then they are expecting too much from me and I'm showing off so I better stop 
So I will start smoking again and I will give up the good way. And what? I hear people talk like this. And when I ask them, brother, you used to be like this. Now you're like this. What happened? He will say, oh, you know, I became like this. People were talking about me. They thought of me like this. So I said, I will show them. Yeah, and I will go back in the opposite direction like I used to be. Why? That's not right. That's also shirk. You are not doing good deeds or not doing a bad deed because of people. So then again, you are associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are just some of the uh, concepts related to ikhlas. I hope that it was a reminder for myself and my brothers and sisters. At the same time, we hope that it is a uh, some new points that maybe we've highlighted there for everyone to benefit from. Some of these subtleties, we don't necessarily think about them or we are not conscious to them. Do we conceal our good deeds the way we conceal our bad deeds? Do we ensure that we are also not not doing a good deed because of showing off for people, for example? So these are some of the subtleties that the believer becomes conscious of. And a believer is somebody who is very protective of their heart and of their iman and of their good deeds. Same way that a stingy, mean person is protecting their money in this life. Same way that a hypochondriac is protecting their heart and their health physically in this life. You know what a hypochondriac is? Those people who are always afraid of getting sick. Somebody coughs, they go running, they put a mask on. If they sneeze, they say, maybe I have cancer or AIDS or I don't know. They're always afraid of illness and so on. This is a hypochondriac. So a believer should be like that about his spiritual heart and about his soul. Always worried. He sees some small symptom. Oh, what is this? You are showing off? What is this? Start talking to himself, worried about himself, that he may have one of those diseases of the soul, of the heart always working to purify their heart, to purify their intentions. And the Prophet ﷺ reminded us that إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ All actions are in accordance with their intention. And he gave example. You make hijrah for the sake of getting married or for the sake of some dunya, then that's what you'll get. But whoever made hijrah for Allah and his messenger وسلم, then they will be rewarded accordingly. So intentions can make the smallest of actions so great and it can make the greatest of actions worthless or even against you on the Day of Judgment. So a small word that a person says, the Prophet ﷺ said, can enter them into paradise. One word that you say can be the cause of going to paradise. Why? Because of the sincerity and the intention behind it and because of the good results that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought because of blessing the effect of that word. Subhanallah. And at the same time, one word can enter somebody into hellfire. Because of the intention they had behind it, because of the uh, uh, consequences and effects that it had in this world. People go to war over a word. Isn't that right? Words between people can cause nations to go to war and millions of people to die. Subhanallah. So may Allah protect us. Uh, this hadith that actions are by the intentions, Imam Shafi'i said this hadith is a third of all knowledge. And other scholars said it's half of all knowledge. It's so important. It's a pillar. Because we said every action can only be accepted if it has these two conditions. Sincerity and being done correctly in accordance with the Prophet Wasallam's teachings. So may Allah make us from those who are sincere and make us from those who are concerned about our intentions and sincerity. And may He purify our intentions in all that we say and all that we do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. I open it for uh, question and uh, comments, corrections. Please. Yeah. So does that mean that uh, this sincerity is being compromised? Okay. So this is an excellent question. Our brother is asking that if uh, you know sometimes the donations are given publicly or it's displayed like through the the mock check and all of this, and there's like a ceremony and so on. Is that something that is not allowed? Uh, it is allowed to give publicly. And the Prophet ﷺ did that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed about that in the Quran. Those who give publicly and secretly. So it is something that is allowed. And it's something that is actually encouraged. Because when you give in public, what do you do? You encourage others to give. 
you encourage others to give. So when you see your brother who's at the same status as you, shaitan is telling you, hey man, you can't afford. You have your college education for your children. You have your retirement to think about. Remember, you're going to go on vacation. You want to go to Hajj next year. Don't give. How can you give? You can't afford it. Then you see your friend who you know is about the same level as you and he raises his hands and he pledges to give a certain amount. So you say, if he can give, I can give too. How come I'm being so stingy? So you say, Alhamdulillah, I will give too. So you feel encouraged by that. So that can bring good results. And the Prophet ﷺ used to do public fundraising in the masjid like that. He would ask people to bring and they would bring and give in front of others. So it is allowed. But the person who is giving has to strive and struggle to make sure their intention is sincere. And they should also give secretly at other times as well where nobody knows. Because the Prophet ﷺ specifically praised the group who gives so secretly that even the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Meaning they are giving so secretly nobody knows about it. They give all the time, right? And they give without even maybe their own family knowing. They don't tell them, you know how much we gave today or this month. No, they give. So they can have both of these kinds. But the one that is done publicly, a person needs to really be cautious and strive to make sure, remind themselves, ask themselves, you are going to give this for the sake of Allah. No one else. If nobody else could see or know about it, you would still give. But the forum was a forum where you are giving publicly to encourage people or whatever then there's nothing wrong with that. But if the intention is only to get your name on a building or to have some kind of uh, commercial about you on television or something like that, obviously then this is not a sincere intention. Um, the recent movie about the, the Prophet Muhammad Cause a worldwide protest. Okay. Now, why yet the destruction of the Prophet's birthplace, where he prayed and founded Islam, has been allowed to continue without any criticism in, at Medina? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about the details of that. You're saying recently they are doing some expansion, and they destroyed something. Uh, what did they destroy? Well, apparently Khadija's um, grave has been moved. Has been moved. And it's for now a, a toilet. It's it's now what? A public toilet. But this is where, next to the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid? And they are also moving the, um, yeah, the, the mosque and also his grave. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, do, I don't know about all the details of it. I would have to check into it and see. But the idea is sometimes we may attach certain significance to things that... Um, cannot be prioritized above other things. So for example, we found people were outraged about the movie against the Prophet ﷺ. But for example, maybe people that went out and protested don't pray five times a day on time, for example. So the scholars have differed, but a large number of scholars said somebody who doesn't pray can be considered a non-Muslim. So what would the Prophet ﷺ feel towards you as someone who doesn't pray? But then you said, I love the Prophet ﷺ and I defend his honor. You want to defend his honor? Follow his sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you claim to love Allah, then follow me. Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ in the Quran to say, if you truly love Allah, we should love Allah even more than the Prophet ﷺ. Then if you truly love him, if you truly love the Prophet ﷺ, how do you show your love? The scholars have a lines of poetry in Arabic that they recite that the one is to the one that they love obedient you can find even in this worldly life a man was a certain way then all of a sudden he changed they say what happened to you he said I'm in love so now he's in love because of his love he does anything the woman tells him to do jump he says how high sit down sit he's in love right so when you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallam, you become obedient to them you do what they ask. You are willing to do anything for their sake. So the Prophet ﷺ asked us to do some basic things. But we find Muslims going out and protesting, but they are not fulfilling actually those basic things. So how insulted would the Prophet ﷺ be by your actions? Not praying, not fasting, not giving zakah, not going for hajj. And then we said we are outraged at what the non-Muslims are doing against the Prophet ﷺ. What about what the Muslims are doing against the Prophet ﷺ? 
by not following his teachings, by arguing and debating against his sunnah. We say simple thing. The Prophet ﷺ said, do A, B, C. People said, well, but we live in a different time. B, okay, but A, I'm not sure. And C, is it really compatible for the 21st century? And they start giving like philosophy and debating and come on. And then when the cartoon comes out or this kind of movie comes out, they said, wow, how could the people say this against the Prophet ﷺ? What you are saying is borderline kufr words. What are you talking about? You're talking against revelation and you are talking about it as if it's normal people's words. This can take you out of Islam if you have a problem with what the Quran tells you to do. You have a problem with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This can take you out of Islam. It's a huge deal. So sometimes our priorities are a bit confused and our outrage is misplaced. Doesn't mean we should not be outraged about what they are doing towards the Prophet ﷺ, but there are other matters that led to this point. How come they can freely transgress against our Prophet ﷺ? How come they have no respect for us, for our religion? How come? For our ummah. Did we bring that upon ourselves? Of course. That we are now insignificant, even though we are 1.7 billion people in the world. 5 million Jews can take from us anything they want, can control us, can do whatever they want. What is this? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So where is the outrage about that? Where is the outrage about a Muslim being slaughtered? in Syria and Burma and, 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 and you can list 15 countries where Muslims are being slaughtered right now. And the Prophet ﷺ said, for the Kaaba to be destroyed brick by brick is easier in the sight of Allah than the blood of one believer be shed. And if the Kaaba were destroyed now, what will the Muslims do? They will go crazy. They will attack anyone who does that. They will kill them if the Kaaba were to be destroyed. The Prophet ﷺ said it's easier in the eyes of Allah for Kaaba to be destroyed brick by brick. Then one person, innocent believer, be killed. But yet what is our outrage? What are we doing? Subhanallah, our hearts are dead. So alhamdulillah, we saw that there is some life in the heart still. There is some ghira, some jealousy for the Prophet ﷺ, for the religion of Islam, that we have some protective nature. But then what is the proper reaction to that? So to go and, for example, burn property, burn cars and shops. and The person whose car you burned or shop you burned in the protest, what was his crime? He's a Muslim, for example. And you burned his car because you said, I love the Prophet ﷺ. What? Prophet ﷺ told you, destroy innocent person's property because someone insulted my name? Doesn't make sense. Or four or five Muslims in the protest die. What? One person, we just said, if they die, it's worse than Kaaba is destroyed. Now, because the Prophet ﷺ was insulted, we killed our own people. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. So we need to be logical and not just emotional. That emotion should lead to proper action. Did we ever inform anyone about the Prophet ﷺ correctly, who's not a Muslim, or who's a Muslim that's far away from Islam and the Sunnah? Did we ever take time to tell them who the Prophet ﷺ really is? Did we spend any money, any effort, and so on and so forth to try to promote the Prophet ﷺ and the religion of Islam and to make da'wah and so on? Did we not seize this opportunity where all this attention is being pay paid and say, let's come out with a good movie about the Prophet ﷺ's life, a documentary? Did we ever say that we can produce something to counter this? Some people are doing those kind of actions, alhamdulillah. And so many people can convert in these kind of situations. Because now their interest is piqued. Oh, what is going on? Who is this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We don't know about him. So they know that this person who is showing something is hateful. They are willing also to hear another argument if they are honest people and if they are interested in the truth. So did we take advantage of that opportunity? Subhanallah. So uh, now this issue, if it is occurring, I'm sure they have their muftis there who are giving fatwa. I'm not a scholar to give fatwa about that. But we know the Prophet ﷺ, for example, when he built the prophetic masjid, the land that was purchased uh, had graves in it. So the Prophet ﷺ had those graves dug up and moved because it's haram to build a masjid on top of graves or it's haram to bury people in a masjid, obviously, right? This is not allowed. You are not allowed even to pray towards graves or, or, or to, uh, uh, you know, do these kind of acts of worship at the graves, even if you are intending it for Allah. 
So the Prophet ﷺ had the graves moved. So now if the masjid is being expanded and there are graves there and they dug up the graves and moved them, Allah alam that this is something already the Prophet ﷺ had done himself before. Even if the person who is buried there, of course, is so uh, uh, righteous or so noble and special, but still, I mean, uh, the Prophet ﷺ's masjid is a speci special masjid that 1.7 billion people want to go to and visit. So they may say we have to expand that masjid to try to accommodate the people. Now only 2-3 million people will go uh, per year for Hajj. So uh, this is uh, this is something that may be you know, due to necessity. But I don't believe that the scholars would allow such a thing as some kind of desecration of the Prophet Sallallahu home or, or his family or as some sort of an insult. No, this is not what is intended at all, of course. Of course. But we need to make sure also that we emphasize what is truly significant and important when it comes to these kind of things. So praying, this is something that's a dividing line between Muslim and non-Muslim. But yet we find people who are out in the protest or angry over this, for example, expansion of the masjid or whatever it is, they will say, we defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, we love him so much, and they don't pray. So how much do you really love the Prophet ﷺ if you don't even follow him in the basic commands that he gives? May Allah protect us. Any questions from our sisters? Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, I don't see where if, the microphone is. Go ahead. If we have money in the bank, okay. which is accruing interest, okay. which is riba, okay. and we give it away to charity, what is the hukum or what can we do with such money? Um, so the first suggestion would be to take your money out of interest banks. So here in Malaysia, you have Islamic banks, alhamdulillah. Even maybe there is some difference of opinion about some of the transactions in those banks. But whatever, it's still better than a fully interest-based bank. At least you can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I tried to put my money in the place that I thought will be most halal. So my recommendation would be you take your money out of banks where they are giving you interest. Even in such banks, you can have accounts that don't earn interest. You can have current account where you're not getting any interest. So there should be no reason to have money in some kind of savings account where it's accruing interest. This is number one. Number two, the scholar said that kind of money is haram, the interest that you accrue. So you need to get rid of it. But at the same time, it's not halal for charity. It's not halal for people to eat from it and live from it and so on. So scholars, uh, the fatwa I've heard before that they mention is that you can give it for al-maslah al amma You give it for the public benefit. Maybe for some kind of uh, paving the road or uh, the public bathrooms or the lighting or something like this. Something, you know, in the, in the society. But not for your own family or your own home or the orphans or something like that. No, you cannot give it for those causes. It's already impure money. But rather than you just burn the money or throw it in the garbage, at least you put it for some use. Right? So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's cursed money. And the Prophet ﷺ cursed those who give and receive interest. It's a huge, huge deal. It's a big deal. But unfortunately, we don't look at it. We don't equate it with stealing and killing and rape and so on. But it's, it's the same. It's that bad. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah ﷻ only declared war twice in the Quran and Sunnah. Once is against those who use interest in the Quran. The other one is against those who harm the believers in the Sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ Allah." So be aware that Allah declares war against you if you deal with interest, if you deal with riba. So it's a big deal. On the day of judgment, the angels will come to those who deal with interest and say, choose your weapon. So the person will say, choose my weapon. What are you talking about? For what? They will say, don't you know that Allah declared war against you and you accepted? So choose your weapon to fight. So what will your weapon do? Nuclear weapon, whatever weapon you can have, you cannot do anything against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is the kind of uh, audacity a person is having by dealing with interest. You are basically saying, I challenge Allah and his system. Interest is so evil that the financial crisis in the world today is caused by interest. It destroys entire lives. Nations are crumbling because of interest. So participating in such an evil system, you are advocating this corruption and this destruction. So the Prophet ﷺ cursed many different people involved with interest, those that give it, those that receive it, those that sign and, and, and are witnesses on the contract, and so on and so forth. 
So we need to make sure that we are not involved with it in any way. The Prophet ﷺ said there are many different types of interest, the least of which is like a person commits zina with their own mother. So we need to make sure that we are not bringing the curse of Allah upon our home, our car, our property, our family, our food. You see, the, the thing that I'm shocked about is sometimes people are very, very cautious about halal food. So they say, I have to buy only halal food. But if you buy halal food with haram money, it's still ha haram food. It's not halal. Even the Prophet ﷺ slaughtered the animal for you and then you buy it with your haram money, it stays haram. It cannot be halal. So this is something very serious and very important we have to understand. Sometimes we find brothers, they say, I don't eat meat unless it's slaughtered, but then he owns liquor store. I've seen this in the West. And then he says, but I go hajj every year and I built the masjid over there with the liquor store money. What? Allah will accept your masjid or your hajj when it's all financed with haram? Of course not. So we need to be very cautious and concerned about these kind of matters. May Allah protect us. May Allah bless us and give us a way out from that kind of situation. Sometimes we didn't know and we get stuck in this kind of situation, but we have to take the proper steps and seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance to get out of those kind of situations. May Allah help us. Okay, any other uh, questions from the brothers? Yes. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Um, I just would like to follow through what you said earlier. Okay. A, quote, a scholar who said recently in the dinner that we had, he said sometimes what we do, even the shaitan is, is taken aback, you know. So I'm hard. not responsible for that. Yeah. Now, if we do something for the sake of Allah, but we also do it because we want to treat it as an example. Okay. Something we pray in the house. Yeah. An example of our children, of our grandchildren, yeah. to... For, to imitate what we're doing, to do yeah. what we're doing, and we feel good about it. But we feel good, but we said, Alhamdulillah to Allah. So is that all right? Yeah, of course. Of course. So this is a, a good question, which is, let's say, for example, you pray in your house and you want it to be an example to your children and so on. The Prophet ﷺ said, you have to do that. He told us to do that. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't let your house be like a grave. Meaning grave, there is no prayer, because you are dead, finished. But your home must be alive with salah. Alive with Salah, one of the main reasons for that is that it is a form of training and preparation for your children. You are teaching your children how to pray. So it's important that a father, even if he goes to the masjid all the time, still does some prayers at home. And the children are seeing that and this is a good example. And he's also encouraging his wife and family and making sure everyone is praying on time at home and so on. So this is something essential that you must do. And if you see good effects of that and you are happy about that, of course this is also a good thing. This is excellent. The Prophet ﷺ used to always be happy when he would see good things happen, but he would say what? He would say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi bi ni'matihi tatimmu salihat. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, all praise is due to Allah, who by his bounty and his blessing and grace, the good things, the righteous things are accomplished and achieved. So again, you are still attributing it back to Allah. You are saying, Alhamdulillah, that Allah used me, made me a cause for my children to be good, for example. And you are hoping they will be the sadaqa jariya for you. They will make dua for you after you are gone. You feel good and happy about that when you see them in a good situation. This is something positive and good. But doesn't mean you become arrogant because of it. Or you feel overly proud of yourself. Like, look at me, I'm so amazing what I have accomplished. No, you say, Alhamdulillah, that Allah blessed me and used me for this thing. Like if Allah guides someone through you. You feel very happy about that and so excited, but you don't feel proud of yourself. You feel happy that Allah used you and blessed you because he could have used anyone else. And you still hope that Allah accepts it from you because he could use you and not accept you. And that's a dangerous one, ya Allah. So Allah may make us put a lot of effort and a lot of money and time and in the end he's just using us. Because we are not sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use the enemy of Islam to support Islam and bring victory to Islam. Allah can use the enemy of Islam to help Islam. Allah can use anything. Allah says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو Nobody knows the soldiers of Allah except him. He uses anyone and everyone that he wants. Fir'aun raised Musa in his home. 
Do you think Fir'aun will be rewarded for that? No. Did Allah use Fir'aun to bring Musa alayhi salam to destroy him in the end? Subhanallah. So Allah can use, can use anyone he wants and anything. He's in full control in this universe. So he may use us to guide others or to bring about good things, but maybe he didn't accept it from us. So this is very dangerous. So we should always be concerned, even if we are happy about the good results that we see. You see the balance that I'm, I'm kind of mentioning there, inshallah? Yeah. Zakallah khair. Any questions from our sisters? Any other questions? Comments, corrections? Okay, from our brothers? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Um, could you please recommend us uh, a translation of Quran which is uh, authentic and and plain in language? Of course, in English. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Uh, translations of the Quran, there are many out there. Some of them are very good linguistically, but they do have some mistakes in the, uh, in the uh, interpretation. Because a translation is an interpretation, it's a tafsir as well. You are putting your understanding, your interpretation. So some of those that are very strong linguistically may have some issues when it comes to some of the concepts about Allah's names and attributes, for example, or things like that. So we need to be a little bit cautious about that. Uh, but two good ones would be the Muhsin Khan. Muhsin Khan Hilali. That's an excellent uh, translation. The only thing that's a bit cumbersome about it is there are so many brackets. So they add a lot of tafsir from Ibn Kathir, Rahimullah, and, and Al-Tabari and so on. And they insert that in there. So they don't give you only the translation, but they give you what does that word mean. It's referring to, for example, a, you know, a whole phrase or paragraph there. So that can make it a little bit difficult uh, to read. The other one that's a good one that has been recommended uh, by, by others to me is Sahih International. Sahih International translation. That one was done by a group of uh, converts in Saudi Arabia. So I think that one is a pretty good one. It's using quite simple language. Yeah. So those are two good ones. Allah alam. Inshallah. Any question from the sisters? One last time. Okay. Brother. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want alaykum to salam. ask about sadaqah during Salat al-Jum'ah. Sadaqah during, during Salat al-Jum'ah. Yeah. Like, uh, what what uh, do you say about that? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I wanted to ask about that myself. I saw they pass around these uh, buckets or uh, baskets, and also there are children that are going through and collecting and so on. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ would collect, you know, sadaqah on Eid, khutbah, for example, uh, or different times in the masajid. I don't know if he collected in the Jum'a khutbah, but this is where the khatib himself is the one who is encouraging people to give then maybe someone is there collecting it as part of that uh, that announcement so uh, maybe based on that it would be allowed but I don't know I cannot give a fatwa about that the thing that was concerning to me as well is when the boys who are going through people will divide the money and they will give part in the box and they'll put part in the boys pocket like encouragement for him or a tip or something like that so I don't know if something like this is allowed Islamically because one uh, zakah collector in the Prophet Sallallahu time who came back with uh, the zakah that was collected he said this is for Allah and his messenger and this is for me this was given to me as a gift by the people I collected zakah from so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi got very upset and he stood on the pulpit and he said let people who received wealth from collecting zakah sit at their mother and father's home and see what they would have gotten from gifts meaning you would have never have gotten anything so it's not morally acceptable uh, for a zakah collector to take gifts from the one they are collecting zakah from just like a judge cannot take gifts from somebody who they are judging in the court there's a conflict of interest there and then it can become almost like a form of bribery Hey, look the other way. You know how many millions I have? I'm going to give this much zakah. I'm not going to pay the full amount. As if it's like a tax. They're looking at it. Of course, zakah, we don't look at it as a tax. It's a sadaqah. It's a charity that you're giving willingly as an act of worship. It's not something that you are to be forced. But in an Islamic society, Muslims would have the zakah collected from them. And they have to pay it. And they'll be held accountable if they don't pay it. It'll become a big deal. So, 
you cannot give gifts to the zakat collector, then it can become this kind of conflict of interest. Now, does that apply in the normal sadaqa? Like this guy is collecting the sadaqa and people are giving him gifts at the same time? I'm not sure. But this is something that crossed my mind. I was a little bit uh, uh, wondering about that. And maybe I will ask Sheikh Hussein or somebody more knowledge, inshallah, to get the, the full answer. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from our brothers? Okay, we have one announcement here. Uh, there's a camp, inshallah, the youth camp for 2012 is coming up in December, the 9th through the 13th of December. It'll be five days and four nights. So it's called the Time Travelers, Unravel Back to the Golden Era of the Youth. And it's going to be in Kalumpang Training Resor Resort in Hulu, Silangor. Yeah? So uh, the camps are excellent. I participated in one in the past and it was really amazing. And I heard the last uh, ones that occurred were even better, subhanAllah. So Sheikh Hussein will be in this one and I hope to be there as well, inshallah. It's open to brothers and sisters ages 12 to 21 years old. And uh, there are flyers outside about the cost and all of the information there, inshallah. So please, uh, you know, sign up for the youth. I think it does have limited seats and it does fill up quickly. So there may be only limited seats left. So for anyone who's interested, for their uh, uh, children or their uh, relatives, inshallah, please get more information outside. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.